In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, open my lips. And now we your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Through Isaiah, the Lord declared, the Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. The Apostle Peter exhorted God's people, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In expectation of God's grace, let us humbly confess our sins to the Lord and receive his forgiveness. Gracious God, because you desire not the death of sinners, but that we turn from our evil ways and live. We come to you in sincere confession of our sins, those sins we know and those we do not know, sins of actions and inaction, sins that are worthy only of punishment and death. For the sake of your son's sacrificial death, cleanse us by his blood and refresh our bodies and souls with your forgiveness and peace. Then turn us to serve you in holiness and pureness of living today and forever. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Good news, people of God. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. His boundless love extends through the cross of Jesus to you. I, therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the Lord, announce God's grace to you. And in the stead of by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we confess our faith. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. And you may be seated for the next hymn. The theme for tonight is overcoming ego, overcoming ego by the cross of Christ. So all the scripture readings today deal in some form with ego, except that the word ego is never used in the scripture. So you won't hear that specific word, but there are different references to the same thing that we call ego. 
Old Testament reading from Proverbs chapter 16. How much better to get wisdom than gold, to choose understanding rather than silver. The highway of the upright avoids evil. He who guards his way guards his life. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. This is the word of our Lord. And then the epistle reading from James chapter 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is the word of our Lord. And then in the gospel reading for today, we're in the time of Jesus' trials. Uh, Jesus had been on trial before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. They found him guilty of blasphemy. And then they took him to Pontius Pilate. Uh, Pontius Pilate also sent him for a brief time over to Herod. Herod is the one we want to look at here tonight from Luke 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led Jesus off to Pilate. And they had been accusing him, saying, We found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests of the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been waiting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, But Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. This is the word of our Lord. Okay, children's message time. Kids, come on up. Have a seat on the floor, please. I will sit too. All right, glad to have all of you here. Okay, so during Lent now, we've been talking about other people involved in the death of Jesus, right? Jesus is, of course, the most important, but there's other people that are involved. Okay, so let me ask you who we've been talking about so far. The first group of people were those that thought that they knew God's law, but the thing was they were making up their own law. They made up their own law, and then they were teaching that, and they thought that they were good because they kept the rules that they made up. Who was that? The scribes and the Pharisees. Very good. They are in the entire story. They always stand opposed to Jesus. And that's why, because they're making up their own stuff. Okay? All right, then we talked about a man who betrayed Jesus. He sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Who was that? Judas. 
Judas was one of Jesus' disciples, but he liked money more than he liked Jesus, so he betrayed him, sold him out, okay? Then we talked about a man who was the chief high priest, the one who really was leading the charge against Jesus because he could not stand him at all. What was his name? <laughs> what was his name, Megan? Caiaphas. Caiaphas. Caiaphas was a bad man. He really was. He was supposed to be the leader, the religious leader for the people. He didn't care about the people. He only cared about himself. And he really couldn't stand it that people were liking Jesus more than him. So he wanted Jesus dead. After Jesus was arrested, he was the man who saw Jesus first. In the trial that Caiaphas had, this is the people we talked about last week, in the trial that Caiaphas had for Jesus, he brought in people who told lies. Who were they? We don't have specific names. We just labeled them something. Last week, who remembers? Congregation? False witnesses. False witnesses. A witness is someone who claims to have seen something, but these guys lied. They lied all over the place. That's how this was going with Jesus. Okay? Now tonight, we're talking about King Herod. King Herod. Remember that one. King Herod. Now the thing with King Herod is this. He's the king, but not right there in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has a leader, a Roman leader, named Pontius Pilate. We'll talk about Pontius Pilate next week, okay? But that's where, that's where he rules. But then there's another region of Israel, way up in the north. It was called Galilee. And that's where Herod was the leader. Herod was the leader up there. Jesus was arrested in Jerusalem, okay? So really, Herod didn't have anything to do with it. Except that Herod was in Jerusalem that very day. It was Passover. He was there. He wanted to be there as well. So now Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate did not want to have anything to do with this case. He hated the whole thing. He knew that it was a lie. He knew that Caiaphas was not telling the truth. So he didn't want have anything to do with it. But then he heard that Herod was in town. And he said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send Jesus over to Herod. And Herod can take care of everything. When Herod saw Jesus, he was happy. You know why? He had heard that Jesus performed many miracles. He knew about a lot of the miracles that, Jesus had claimed, that was claimed that Jesus had done. And Herod was hoping to see what? A miracle. He wanted a show. Give me a show. Entertain me. Impress me, he was saying to Jesus. With the understanding that if he did, Herod could let him go. Herod could let him go. Did Jesus want to be let go? Jesus had to go to the cross. That's the only way you could be saved. He had to go to the cross. So is Jesus going to do a miracle for Herod? No way. And that made Herod mad. He expected to have fun. He expected to be entertained that day. And when Jesus wasn't cooperating, they tried to make their own fun. They knew that Jesus claimed to be a king, so they dressed him up in a fancy robe. On the picture up there, that's what they're doing. On the picture up there, they put him in a white robe. Sometimes we think of it being a purple robe. It doesn't matter. It's a robe to make him a pretend king. And then the soldiers, and even Herod was getting into it. Let's bow down to him and pretend that he's the king. Oh, most holy king. And then they would laugh and laugh and laugh, thinking that that was funny by mocking Jesus, by making fun of him. That's why you see on the picture, 
They're all laughing, right? Can you tell which one is Herod? The one sitting on the throne in the back. He's laughing as much as the other ones. Oh, isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? They've got God in front of them, and they're making fun of him. But their fun got a little tiresome. All of a sudden, they weren't laughing so much, and it got boring. So you know what Herod did? Said, Jesus, get out of here. Go back to Pontius Pilate. He had a chance to have a conversation with the creator of the universe, the one who had come to save everyone, the one who Passover was all about. And he just wanted Jesus to entertain him. Make me feel good, Jesus. I don't care about your truth. I don't care about your gifts. I don't care about forgiveness. Just make me feel fun. It's pretty sad, isn't it? Pretty sad. But this whole story about Jesus is filled with lots of sad people. Fortunately, the main character in the story is Jesus. And he's not fooling around. He is offering himself for you, to love you, to forgive you, to make sure that you are with him forever and ever and ever. We can smile about that. We can be happy about it. We don't laugh at it. Not funny. It's great because Jesus loves us so much. Okay? We'll have one more character next week, and that'll be Pontius Pilate. Okay? Thank you very much. You guys can go back to your seats. And while they're doing that, we're going to sing the next hymn, Grant Lord Jesus That My Healing.
and grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word eagle, the word eagle generally refers to an exaggerated sense of self importance, which usually then results in an excessive preoccupation with self. The ego is who you think you are. It's your identity determined by external things like body image, education, clothes, friends, social status, job, successes, accomplishments, and the like. Rooted in the sinful nature, ego can easily turn into an it's all about me attitude and lifestyle. There's a whole lot about ego. It's a very complicated kind of subject. But that's the definition that I'm using here tonight when we're talking about overcoming ego, overcoming this idea of self-importance, that I'm everything, uh, and what that all means and stuff like that. Now, a good example of it, indeed, is Herod. Herod is all about ego. That's how you understand Herod, okay? At the end of the gospel reading for today, it was this line that after Herod had sent Jesus back to Pontius Pilate, Herod, the, the scripture says this, that day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. What's that all about? Well, let me tell you. And it's all about ego, frankly, okay? Just a little quickly, history about Herod. This is Herod Antipas. There's a whole lot of Herods. This is Herod Antipas. He is the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the Herod who ruled at the time Jesus was born. Remember, he was the one who wanted to kill the baby boys in Bethlehem? Okay, that's Herod Antipas' father. Herod the Great was an impressive ruler. He was evil to the core. Evil to the core, but he was impressive in the things that he built and the armies that he maintained and the extent of his kingdom. He had pretty much the entire eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. He was under Rome. He was under Rome. You know, he had a report to, to, the, to the Roman emperor, but he was pretty, pretty powerful. Well, when he died, this is Herod Antipas' dad, when dad died, Herod Antipas kind of thought, the kingdom should be mine. The kingdom should be mine. Well, it didn't turn out that way. Because the emperor, the Roman emperor said, we're not going to let anyone become as powerful as Herod ever again. This is not good. So he divided Herod's empire into four different sections. And Herod didn't even get the best section. <laughs> he didn't. The best and most powerful section was Judea, where Jerusalem was. That went to his brother Archelaus. Herod Antipas got Galilee. Galilee. It was bad enough being over in that area anyway, so far away from Rome, but now you were really stuck out in the boonies. Galilee. That was his territory. Then it got worse. Archelaus died. And now Antipas thought, oh, here's my chance. I should get that territory. I'm the son, the son who's next in line. But by this time, the emperor was getting fed up with the entire Herod family. And he said, no, no more Herods over here at all. I'm just going to place Roman governors there. Eventually, the governors became Pontius Pilate. That did not sit well with Herod Antipas. Oh, the affront to his dignity. He was a Herod. He was the son of Herod the Great. He deserved that. And he was just slapped in the face by how he was being treated. That's how come he hated Pontius Pilate. Couldn't stand him. Because his ego had been hurt. Because he wasn't given what he thought he deserved. But then came the trial of Jesus. Okay? Okay? Now, you already heard me explain this. Pontius Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with it. He knew Jesus was innocent, but he didn't want to offend Caiaphas either. 
because that could cause trouble. So he came up with the brilliant plan, let's have Herod make a decision. It was pure self-interest. He had no respect for Herod at all. It was just a matter of push the case over to him so I don't get in trouble. But Herod, egoist that he is, takes this as a compliment, as a tribute to his Wisdom, a tribute to his leadership, a tribute to the fact that he really is the authority. And he is honored. He is honored that Pontius Pilate did something so wonderful to him, patted him on the back and said, here, you take this incredibly important case. Herod's ego was ready to explode. He was so happy that he was finally acknowledged for who he was. Great. He was acknowledged for who he was by a man who absolutely didn't want to make a decision and was just trying to pawn off a case on him. Those two made really good friends. But that's how it works with ego. When ego gets involved, when ego overwhelms, when ego becomes so very, very important that self, that me, myself, and I is everything. Okay, let's talk about all that. Like I said, this is a complicated kind of thing, um, but we'll talk about some things anyway. I read quite a bit, did a lot of research for this about ego and what people were saying about it and what psychologists were saying, what researchers were saying and stuff like that. What does the Bible say? It's the most important thing as far as I'm concerned. One of the things that kept coming up was always that many people who are indeed so full of themselves, when ego just takes over, is that they often don't even recognize it. They don't recognize it. They just think that's how it should be. And that's perfectly normal. So I came across one site that said, here are five questions to ask yourself to see if ego is really very important in your life or not so important, okay? So I'm gonna ask you those five questions. And I want you to think about it for yourself. I did, I've done done this now already, so I've done it myself a couple of times, all right? So think about it that way. Now, here's the deal. In one sense, I don't think that the stuff I'm gonna be talking about tonight applies first and foremost to you folks. You're already Christians. You already indeed have recognized that your worth and your value, your identity is a gift from God given to you freely by Jesus Christ. You have already learned, in fact, to put down your ego a good number of times, recognizing that God has indeed declared you his child, and that's the highest honor there can possibly be. And yet, ego is still a constant threat, a constant temptation to all of us. All of us. Okay, so think about these questions and don't think about them about someone else. If you're doing that, if you're thinking how this applies to that person over there, I can guarantee your ego's out of whack. Okay, one of the things about ego is that ego really doesn't want us to do self-examination. We really don't. And it gets to be hard. And that's the whole thing about confession being difficult. Because confession means that you actually have to think about your life honestly in comparison to what God says. And that's hard for a lot of people. Okay? So anyway, here are just some quick five type things. Five signs that I may have an out of place ego. Number one, I habitually look at things mostly from the standpoint of how they affect me. Okay? Oh, there's a flood over there in Nebraska. whoop de doo it doesn't bother me. I don't care. It doesn't affect me. You said something bad about me. Hmm, yes, that bothers me. Okay? Here's an opportunity that'll make me feel good. Okay, yeah, I'll think about that. How does it affect me? And if it doesn't affect me, I really don't think about it very much. Number two, I am frequently offended and hurt by other people. The idea is here that an egotist, an egoist uh, person who thinks that everything is about them and they're the center of their own little universe, if someone says something that challenges that, if someone says something that is contrary to what the egoist thinks is true, they don't like it. They don't like it at all. 
And they're offended. They're offended by it. We talked on Sunday about how in our culture today, that's all we're hearing about. I shouldn't say all we're hearing about. It's a lot of what we hear about. I'm offended. I'm offended by this. I'm offended by what you said. I'm offended by what you do. <sighs> Egos getting involved in all of that. Number three, I frequently mistrust and dislike other people. The idea being here that if someone's going to challenge me, if someone's going to say something that offends my ego, uh, frankly, I'm not going to like you so much, and I'm certainly not going to trust you. Because your challenge, your challenge to my identity, and I don't want to have to deal with that. Number four, I'm often surprised and dismayed by any negative reactions to what I say or do. How can anyone disagree with me? I'm so good. How can anyone see it? How can, they not, how can they not see what is so obvious to me? How can you possibly have a different point of view? That makes no sense. That's how the egotist thinks. Because everything is just so set and it's so clear to the ego that if there's a challenge, oh, that is just, there's, there's no logic behind that. It makes no sense. And I think here's the most significant one. Number five, most of my conversations have to do with what's going on in my life. Not about what's going on in someone else's life, not what's going on in the world, just what's going on in my life. Here's an interesting thing to do once in a while. If you're involved with a conversation with a number of people, for a while, don't talk. Just listen. Just listen. And see if you won't hear this happening. Because I hear this happening all the time. Someone's talking about something, whatever it might be and someone else chimes in, takes just a little kernel of what that conversation was about, and starts talking about themselves. That happens a lot. Where conversations get back to me. Get back to me. It's not finding out more about you, it's not finding out more about a situation, it's gotta come back to me. Think about that. Notice that. Think about your conversations. These, again, are signs that the ego, ego's maybe a little more powerful than we want to admit. And maybe we give into that ego a little bit more than we care to admit. And there's problems with ego. Big problems. Just think of it. Ego causes problems in relationships with lots of other people, right? How easy is it to be a friend to someone who's so full of themselves they can only think about themselves and everything's got to be done to please them. How can you have a relationship with a person like that? You can't. One of the things that I deal with in premarital counseling, in premarital counseling, is to try to find out why they are thinking they want to get married. If the answer is, it's because I love this other person so much, I want to do whatever I can for that person to be in their life and to make their life better and to build them up, I'm getting a good answer. But I also get the answer, well, it's because, oh, that person just gives me so much. I get so much from that person. They, they just warm my heart, they give me this, and I just feel so good when I'm around them. Now we've got a problem. Because that's ego talking. That's what do I get out of it? What do I get out of this? The other is, what do I give to it? And there is such a major difference. I think a lot of marriage difficulties do come down to matters of ego. Come down to, I need something, and I'm not getting something. That's what we have to overcome. That is not the way of Christ. The way of Christ is to give, to give, to build up the other person, to put more interest in the other person, and to raise them up. That is the way of Christ. That's exactly what Christ did for you. Raised you up by his grace. See? There's ego. This is not just something about, oh, who am I kind of a person. That's how our society portrays ego. Ego is your identity. Well, when your identity is built upon a sinful human nature that is most concerned about selfishness, 
you're building on a foundation that's going to collapse. Okay? And here's the other way to look at it. Ego messes up a relationship with God. Ego messes up a relationship with God. Because if a person is indeed so full of themselves, so full of themselves, well, where does God fit into that picture? There's no room for God. And most significantly, there's often no need for God. Why do you need a God? Why do you need a God if you're doing everything well? If you're, if you're beyond criticism? If, if you got it all figured out and you can see clearly and if people only listen to you, everything would be good. What do you need God for? Because here's another thing that ego does particularly in our relationship with God, but in relationship with others, is that ego has a hard time seeing sin. Hard time seeing sin. Right? The egoist thinks they do everything right. Right? See, that's what I was saying before. You got a problem then. If you can't see the sin, you have no need for God. Certainly Jesus as Savior. That concept is just totally disconnected. Totally disconnected from anything in my life. Because I've got it all figured out. And I'm doing well. And people should be praising me for it. Why should we be praising God? Stop that. This goes very specifically with repentance. One of the other things is that ego hates change. Ego hates change. And what is repentance? Change, right? I've been saying it all along throughout this entire series. What is repentance? Doing this, which is a contrary to God's will, confessing it, acknowledging it, which is hard, and then receiving God's forgiveness, complete undeserved forgiveness, so that then you can change and do what is right. The egoist says, what do I have to change? What do I have to change? Ego doesn't know about humility. Ego doesn't know about, hey, I've done things wrong. Ego doesn't know about that change can be good. This is serious stuff. This is the challenge of that sinful nature that we have in our relationship with God. A lot of people don't want to hear anything about the commandments. Oh, they like it. They like it when Jesus is there as a nice, friendly little baby in a manger. Oh, that's a cool Jesus. But what about a Jesus who's walking around Galilee and saying, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. What? Stop it. That makes no sense. One of the quotes I read about all this is that egoists love Jesus except when he demands anything. See, ego just wants it like it is. And like it is, is I'm good. I'm fine. And that's what makes a relationship with God so hard. But (laughs) it can be overcome. It can be overcome. We can overcome ego. How? Well, it says by the cross of Christ, that's going to be about Christ, of course. Here's a key Bible passage. Paul writes this. He writes that we need to be crucified to ourself so we can live for Christ. And here's the words. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. Now, obviously, when Paul was talking about I've been crucified with Christ, it's not talking about him being nailed to a tree. That never happened to him. He was not crucified that way. But what's he talking about when he says, I have been crucified with Christ? Here's an interesting tidbit. It's going to be worth the cost of coming in today. In the Greek language, In the Greek language, they got a different alphabet and everything else like that. The word for I 
And now I'm talking about I, like me, I kind of thing, not your eyeball. I. The word is ego. Oh, oh, that's pretty cool. Now, to be honest, to be thoroughly on board, ego in Greek simply means I. You know, I, you, he, she, and all that sort of stuff. That's what it means. It is not referring to our psyche, our inner person, or anything else like that. But it is very interesting that the very word that we use to describe that inner stuff is the word for I. This is what Paul means when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. He means his ego. His ego. And you remember? You remember what we were looking at in Philippians chapter, in the chapters 1 and 2 when we were talking on Sundays going through that book? Paul, he could list everything that he had done and as far as he was concerned, he was doing everything right. There was nothing at all that anyone could tell him otherwise. He couldn't understand how come everyone wouldn't simply agree with him. He was the best. He was the greatest. And he was rising to the very top of the pinnacle of wherever he was going. And you remember him also talking about how it was all rubbish? How it was all nonsense? It was all ego until he came to know Christ. Then what happened? I, I, my ego has been crucified with Christ. Put that just to death. Put ego to death. Because the only thing it's going to do is puff you up. It's going to hurt your relationships with people and your relationship with God. It's going to be nigh near unto impossible. So get rid of it. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. My ego is gone. Now it's Christ who lives in me. That's pretty cool. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Sometimes people in our culture define ego in the sense of identity. And they want to say that it's a good thing. Ego defining your identity is always going to fail you. But God defining your identity is firm and constant for all eternity. Ego defines identity on the basis of what I can do, what I've accomplished, how I look, what other people think of me. Oh my gosh, that is a hopeless proposition on which to build. But God comes to you and says, it doesn't matter what you can do and can't do. It doesn't matter if you're at the top of your class or the bottom of your class. It doesn't matter what you look like, if you're some model of perfection or you're overweight or underweight. It doesn't matter. Because I love you so much that I'm going to even give my son to die for you so that you can be my child today and forever. There's the greatest identity, the greatest esteem that you will ever have. This is not about self-esteem. Self-esteem's a fraud. It's about God-esteem. That God esteems you. You know what the word esteem means? Honor. God honors you. Think about that. The creator of the universe honors you. That's an identity that is more significant than anything that this world could possibly bestow. It's an identity that carries you through this world and on into eternity. It's an identity that makes you a child of God to be with him forever and ever. That's a whole lot better than ego. But still we struggle with that. We still struggle with that old sinful nature that clings to us. And so the scripture tells us, just two more points, then I'm done. 
to put this into practice, okay? You can know it intellectually, that you're an esteemed child of God. You can know it by faith in your heart, and it can be absolutely 100% true. And then in order, in order to be able to put this into practice in your daily life, to be putting down the ego, the scripture emphasizes lots of different things. I'm just emphasizing two. One, humility. Learn to be humble. No egotist is humble. (laughs) Nope. Humility and egoism don't go together. Not at all. Egoism is all about honor me, look at me, look how good I am, pat me on the back, just like King Herod, okay? Humility. Learning to humble ourselves. And then the second thing, service. Service to others. Putting other people first. Who's the prime example of all of that? Right? This is overcoming ego by the cross of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, that memory work I told you about? Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And now God tells us, okay, in your struggles with ego, in your struggles with ego, and we all have them, we all have them, he tells us, look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. The greatest one is the one who humbles himself, the one who comes to serve, When we can practice that joyfully, find find contentment in helping one another, in making humility a true hallmark of who we are, yeah, then we've put down, we put to death that ego. And in our very lives, Christ is honored and Christ is displayed. Christ is displayed in a world that's just full of ego. That's how we overcome. It's for your good and the glory of God. Amen. And the peace of God is past all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. And right now the offering will be received during the... Please stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, when we think about this whole thing about ego... (laughs) Admittedly, sometimes we don't like to even think about it. We'd rather not hear about it sometimes. We'd rather just keep on doing what we're doing, thinking that everything is fine and we're just good. It's hard for us sometimes to confess, and it's even harder for us to repent. We acknowledge all that, dear God, but we do so as your dear children. You have worked faith in our hearts. You have esteemed us with honor and glory, the likes of which this world cannot give. You've made us your children, and you've made us heirs of everlasting life. We are the sons of God. And so we pray that you'll help us to draw upon that strength, upon that truth, to be able to put down the times when ego wells up and wants us to live inappropriately. Help us then to, by your Holy Spirit, to live the life of humility, the life of service that you want us to do. Help us to indeed know that we are dead to ourselves, but Christ lives in us. Help us to live that way, touching the lives of our family and our friends, our community, our country, our world, bringing your light into a very selfish and egotistical world. We also ask for your grace to be with our congregation as we continue to serve you. We pray that we can do so humbly and obediently and serving our neighbors, serving people as they come to know about Christ through us. To that end, we also ask for your blessing to be with us as we call an associate pastor. Uh, We truly pray that through this process, you'll bring to this congregation someone who will help us in our mission. Lord God, we pray again for Pastor Woodford as he's dealing with severe pain uh, because of that uh, bicep issue. We truly pray that you will cause the pain to stop. I mean, literally stop right now. 
but certainly work through the medications that he's receiving and whatever medical procedures still await him, help him to be restored to good health uh, and that he can return home soon. We say the same prayer for Pastor Fran Green, uh, thanking you that indeed the accident was not more serious, a broken back certainly is serious. We thank you for successful surgery, and now we ask that you lay your healing hand upon him and help him to recover, uh, get over the pain, the stiffness, heal him so he can resume his service to you as well. And then we pray for Elise Pevensey as she had surgery on Monday. Uh, We're very grateful that doctors were able to do what they have been able to do. We wish it didn't have to be so much. We wished it was complete. But on the other hand, we trust you to continue to bless her, to heal her, to help her regain her strength and deal with that last piece of, of cancerous tumor that will have to be dealt with by radiation. We pray for success in all of that and healing and, and complete restoration so she'll be able to return home and, and care for her young daughters and, and be the wife and the, and the person that you indeed want her to be. We also ask your grace to continue to be with Mike Fine uh, as he continues to be hospitalized as his immune system is being rebuilt. Continue to bless Lyndon Luke and Adele Norgrant, Dean Tordson, and all the members of our congregation and care centers. Dorothy Shepard, Walter Podin, Nancy Hankey, Martha Betcher, Jim Bailey, Norm Schultz, John Maloney, Corinne Brown, Arlene Hankin, and Eileen Olchen. Keep them all in your care. Be their present joy and strength. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. And the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen.
And thank you so much for joining us. Go in peace and serve the Lord.